This morning we fly from Kununara to Broom. Broom's a small town of 15,000 residents, which grows to 45,000 during the tourist season. Matzo started life as a United Bank of Australia in 1910. The building survived a fire and being moved twice. It became a cafe and microbrewery in 1997 and now distributes beer across Australia and serves really good food. Remember the pearl lugger in the museum in Darwin? By 1900 there were hundreds of these pearl luggers on the Kimberley coast. By that time 80 percent of the world's production of mother of pearl came from the Kimberley. But pearl diving was a dangerous occupation as evidenced by the Japanese cemetery which is the last rest for 919 divers who died during the cyclones of 1887 and 1935 and from drowning or the bends. The next stop on our tour of the Broome area is Ganthamy Point. The lighthouse has stood here since 1906. This current one was built in 1984. The point has some interesting geology, but it's famous for dinosaur prints only visible at low tide. It's time to head for the Port of Broome, where we board the Coral Discoverer. We get underway and have the mandatory abandoned ship drill. After we settle into our cabin, we have some time to explore the ship. We check in on the bridge, discover the spacious lounge, take in the seascape from the sun deck. We find the explorer hung on the stern, and most importantly, we locate the dining room. After dinner, we enjoy a spectacular Kimberly sunset. Overnight, the captain has taken us to the Lesipede Islands. The Zodiacs are in the water waiting for us to go exploring. The breeding colony of brown boobies here, with up to 18,000 breeding pairs, may be the largest in the world. They're strong flyers, but clumsy on takeoff and landing, hence the name. They rely on strong winds and high perches to assist takeoffs. There are four islands in the Lesipede group, cryptically named West, Middle, East, and Sandy. The islands are now a nature reserve, but it hasn't always been a peaceful place. In the late 1800s, it was used by blackbirders it's a place to maroon kidnapped aborigines before conscripting them to work as pearl divers. Lesser frigate birds also nest here. They are kleptoparasitic. That means that they harass other birds to force them to give up their food, which they then devour. But there is a balance in nature. The silver gull's favorite food is frigate bird eggs. But most of the time, the silver gulls have to survive on fish, insects, and crustaceans. The Australian pelican has the longest bill of any bird. The record is 20 inches. These islands are home to a wide variety of shorebirds. They range from the large oyster catcher to the small gray-tailed tattler. If we get too close, there's a flurry of wings as they take to the air. The other large and noisy birds on the beach are terns. The Caspian tern with their bright orange bill and the smaller, lesser crested tern with a yellow bill. That wraps up our first excursion and it's back to the coral discoverer. We wake up off the Montgomery Islands between Collier Bay and Doubtful Bay. We're going to explore a curious phenomenon this morning at Montgomery Reef, which you can just see beyond the zodiacs. Tides here are extreme. Spring tides can be 30 feet between high and low tide levels. Neap tides that we're experiencing now are about 6 to 12 feet in difference. So as the tide goes out, the reef is exposed and cascades of water form to drain the reef. This tide's relatively small. Imagine what a king tide might look like. Birds are attracted to the shallows and pools that the tide leaves. The reef herons here come in two color morphs, gray and white. 
As more of the reef is exposed, we can see the algae that covers it. The solid bits are uh, coralline algae. You get a good look at a good idea of the terracing if it was along there. In amongst them, you've got um, fleshy algae as well. So you can see there's plant matter, more conventional type plant matter growing on that. And that's a, um, uh, a brown algae called sargassum. In a few hours, the reef will be just below the surface of the water again. That's a pretty amazing demonstration of the power of tides. The coral discoverer is on the other side of this arm of a reef. It's almost lunchtime, so it's back to the ship. While we enjoy lunch, the captain moves to, into Collier Bay and anchors off Raft Point. After taking in the dramatic landscape, we board the Explorer for the trip to the beach. Then we hit the trail. Near the top, there's a nicely framed view back to the bay. A little rock scramble and we are at our destination. Some very impressive rock art. Our guide explains that these paintings belong to his people, the Warora. They're quite different in style from what we've seen in Arnhem Land. They feature the Wanjana, cloud and rain spirits who create and sustain the land and its inhabitants. They don't have mouths because they're so powerful they don't need to speak. And if they did speak, the rain would never end. The paintings are also fresh looking. The Warura believe that they have a duty to periodically refresh the paint to keep the Wanjana alive in the painting. There are also some figures done in beeswax. Time to head back to the beach. That ochre on my face says I've been through the smoke ceremony to purify me so I can visit the sacred site. The explorer comes to pick us up off the beach. After another great dinner, we enjoy another great Kimberly sunset.